In 1982, I was doing something that I think most of us do. I went out to dinner, and then I was going to attend a movie. The movie that I attended had such an emotional impact on me that it changed my life and the future of my family's life. When I woke from this uh, encounter with this movie, I was on a birth search. And I was reintroduced to my Polynesian roots. I found out that my grandmother was 100% Hawaiian, Waihihanea, Kohu'upi, and that my mother's name was Mahilani. Polynesians never worship in churches because they live in them. I remember as a child being fascinated by the shape of clouds, by shadows where I would find them. And I still believe today that if I could understand birds, what they were saying, they may have been saying something to me. One of my son-in-laws lives in Hawaii. He still practices the sacred way. He's a fisherman. And before he takes the fish out of the ocean to put on his boat, he asks for permission. You see, something tragic happens when we lose our feeling of sacredness in the world. Something tragic happens to us and the wonder around us. The agricultural revolution led to the scientific revolution. And that's when we learn to rob nature, torture nature for her secrets. Then it was followed by the petrochemical revolution, and now the genetic engineering revolution. We're getting farther and farther away from sacredness. I want to show you a, a picture here of the system of rice intensification. I'm senior advisor to uh, the Better You Foundation and Global Health and Development. And my job and responsibility is to go around the world and train NGOs, non-government organizations, in the training of how to plant rice and agriculture. This was discovered by a French Jesuit priest in 1983. He was working with the Malagasy people during a drought, and he came and discovered something of an innovation. And that is how to plant rice. And that's what I do. I teach rice farmers all over the world how to grow rice. 50% less water, 90% less seed, no use of fertilizers or pesticides. We're now helping rice farmers, subsistence rice farmers, grow rice. We're getting 100 to 150% more produce. Look at these two plants. The plant on the, uh, the larger of the two plants, on both sides, they're of the same seed, the same age, grown in the same soil. The larger of the two plants, the healthier of the two plants, they're grown with 50% less water, 90% less seed, no crowding, no use of fertilizers or pesticides. You can see how healthy they are. The smaller of the two is grown following the green revolution idea of pesticides, fertilizers, and flooded fields. Did you know that rice is not an aquatic plant? For 6,000 years, we've been doing it one way. Dr. F I mean, Father Henry de Launier discovered another way. He discovered an innovation. I thought today what I would do to, because I digress when I speak about these things, these rice plants. We're now using this in Haiti. I just got back from Haiti, where we have a national conference in Haiti. We've transformed the economy in Haiti in terms of the way they grow rice. SRI rice now is being grown uh, in over 40 countries. There's no cost to this. You don't need hybrid seed, you don't need fertilizer, you don't need pesticides, you don't need micro-lending. You just need information. I thought today for my contribution would not be to talk about this particular innovation or even the research we're doing now 
on how to build houses, sustainable housing using recycled trash. These are all wonderful innovations, but the real important thing is not the innovation. Today you're going to be meeting many innovators and many innovations. And I thought my contribution would be if I could tell you and show you the difference between innovation and invention and help you understand the, the mind, I think, of innovators, how they may be somewhat different, and how, if you wanted to be a custodian of innovation, how to have a quiet mind. So, I've only got a few minutes to tell you all this, so let me begin. Innovation is very different than invention. Invention is the product of one or more people working in a disciplined and skillful way to perfect an idea or a technology and to bring it to market. Inventors go after invention. Innovation is quite different. Innovation comes after you. It attaches to you, to certain of you, <laughs> to certain people. I'm going to talk about those people in just a moment. Innovation does not evolve over time. Nothing improves about innovation. Innovation is not human accomplishment. Innovators will talk about being taken by surprise, by being moved by some mission or desire or passion to do something. All of a sudden, when they were making other plans, just like when I was going to out to dinner, or I was just going out for a movie, making other plans. Innovations are fully animated, they're fully realized, they're fully developed, they're waiting for discovery. You stumble across them sometimes, but it's a sacred gift. I mean, do you, do you really think that Gandhi or Martin Luther King chose to lead? Or were they led? Did they pay attention? Were they quiet enough? Did they obey? And one of the things they recognized, as all innovators recognize about innovation, is that somehow, for some reason, they're being inscripted. They're a custodian of an idea, of a passion. Innovations can be music, it can be putting musical notes together in a different way, maybe even discovering a new note. Innovations can be ideas. Innovations already exist. And so what, how does one become an innovator? How does, how does one prepare oneself to be a custodian? Father Henry de Lanier did not decide one day to transform agriculture with SRI. What he did was that he recognized that there are some kinds of things, like innovations, that really defy human understanding. We might do well to admit along with Vokov Havel, past president of the Czech Republic, that there is something in the order of being which evidently exceeds all of our competence. Innovations. Innovators think differently. They have quiet minds. What is a quiet mind? Well, there's three levels of growth and development that I'd like to share with you. Two levels of growth and development, well, all three of them we go through. Two levels make for very busy, noisy minds. When you have a noisy mind, you're not likely to discover the wonder, the sacredness around you. Innovations abound. Innovations are everywhere, and they're waiting to be discovered. Let me tell you about the growth and development that we all go through as people. The first level of development is conformity. Conformity is a very noisy period in your growth and development. We're, worry we're worried about fitting in, belonging, wondering if we're popular. Do people like us? Our minds are constantly active and busy. There's one psychological, pure psychological need in mankind. 
It's not love, it's not worth, not competence. The one pure psychological need in humankind is belonging. Cross cultures, cross genders, it's a feeling of belonging. Conformity is how we learn to belong. We go along to get along. But we're very anxious. Our minds are very active. You're not likely to discover innovation in the period of conformity. The second area of development is independence. At, soon, at some point, you decide you've done the world's bidding long enough. Things start feeling like hand-me-down clothes. They pinch and they bind. And you start feeling the need to find your own path, your own drummer. And so you strike out on your own. But even the growth and development of independence can be a very noisy period because you can be devastated by the disapproval of other people. Why don't they like what I'm doing? Why can't they just let me do my own thing? I'm unhappy with the fact that they don't agree. You see, you don't go through conformity or independence or even our next period at any particular age, at any particular time. It's not like when you graduate from high school or college or get married that you move on and evolve. No, what happens is there's something that happens in you. It's like the budding. It seems like nothing's going on, you're not getting anywhere in life, and all of a sudden you pop into a new growth and development. The third phase is autonomy. Autonomy is where we agree to disagree. It's really okay. You've accepted the fact that you're independent. You know, the period of independence, people are thinking you're rebellious. What's wrong with this person? Why aren't they like one of us? Conformity, independence, very difficult period in growth and development. But autonomy is kind of a feeling of arrived. It's really okay that you don't understand and you don't agree. Remember the old saying, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, does it make a sound? The answer is, of course it makes a sound. Life goes on without us. It's always animated. But a better question is, if you do something of value, and there's no other voice but yours to validate you and to acknowledge what you've contributed, is that enough? Autonomy says it is, and it better be, because no one knows how difficult something was or how easy something was other than you. Your voice must matter. You must always have the first opinion. You may get second and third opinions, but you always reserve the first opinion. Now, when you become, have these quiet minds and develop these quiet minds, there's about five or six principles that you follow. Let me tell you, if I can, with such a prestigious and creative audience, if I can remember all five. One is that innovators, people who have arrived at this place of autonomy, they don't play to crowds. They don't have per personality contests popularity contests. They don't worry about what people think. The most intelligent thing I'm ever going to say to you today, for those of you who are still concerned about what people think of you, I've been a therapist for 33 years. I've been on radio for a long time. I've been out in the public, and I can tell you, take it to the bank, nobody cares. You worried about that spot on your shirt that you wore today, or maybe you wore the same jacket several days in a row, and you're worried about what people think? Nobody cares. And why do they not? I mean, if you fell down, they care enough to help you up. But why do they not care? Because they're so self-consumed. We are all so self-consumed. We don't have a whole lot of time to think about you. So get over yourself. If you want to have a quiet mind, realize nobody cares. I like to say that I feel so much better now that I gave up caring. <laughs> the second observation of a quiet mind is that uh, you have to give up the idea of right and wrong, of good and bad, of positive and negative. You have to give up these ideas. They're fraught with a lot of conflict, noise, and things like that. You're never going to discover sacredness if you're trying to get it right. Stay off of the wrong. Do it positive. Eliminate the negative. 
Forget all that. The only thing that really matters, in my opinion, is true or false. Not right and wrong, good or bad, positive or negative. Either life is true or it's false. The other thing I think in practicing a quiet mind that would help is you have to give up trying to find answers. Answers assume complete understanding, and who is so arrogant as to say that they have complete understanding about anything? I think innovators don't worry about answers. What they're looking for is useful, usable insights. The other thing that I think innovators think, and how to practice quiet mind, is you have to give up solutions. You have to give up the idea of finding solutions. Now, I know I'm pushing the edge of your tolerance when I start talking about these things. But I want you to understand that trying to find a if you find a solution, there's no room for me to participate because you have all the answers and now you have all the solutions. I think what's more important than solutions is improvements. Why not find an improvement, okay? Look for improvements. Insights, not answers. Improvements, not solutions. The truth, not positive, negative, good or bad, right or wrong. And the one last thing I'll leave you with is that if you really want to develop a quiet mind, you have to make the commitment to discipline yourself to not, to eliminate as much mental junk as you possibly can that we all consume at the altar of staying abreast. Quiet mind, innovation, the sacredness that is all around us. Thank you very much.